Alice, welcome to the podcast. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. At the end of March, you released your latest book called The Infinite Onion. Tell us all about the story of Grant and Oliver. Well, Grant is a big surly question mark. <laughs> that is a great description. I love it already. <laughs> he doesn't know what the heck is going on with his life. And sadly, he sort of doesn't care. Oliver, the other main character, he hasn't questioned anything in years. So there's a crash that's about to happen between these two. And Grant has been heading toward homelessness for a while. He loses his job due to an uncharacteristic foray into being creative, which turns him off on creativity in general. And that, that's his perspective. Therefore, he also loses his crap motel room. And that sends him looking for somewhere to stash himself while he figures out what to do next. He squats on his ex-brother-in-law's property until he gets kicked off of there. And so he's in a state of, you know, full belligerent survival mode. All of his familiar, though shoddy, structures are fallen by the wayside recently. And then he meets a man who, who has everything. A great home, a cushy life, friends, and he's an artist. He's creative. This is not... Uh, at first glance, a match made in heaven. <laughs> so <laughs> that artist is, his name is Oliver, and he's an eccentric, he's been living on autopilot for quite some time. So he's got issues of his own, as we like in a romance, Right. but they're buried so deep, he hasn't questioned anything in a while. And so suddenly there's this angry fellow stomping around his property just trying to get his life from being, you know, Grant feels like he's going to fall off a cliff at any second and just die, like literally die. He's that much in survival mode. And, and Oliver is having fun with him. It doesn't feel good and they, they don't like each other, which was what I set out to do as a challenge to myself, a writerly mm -hmm. challenge is to write two characters who don't like each other. I think of it as a tale of two shrews. There's an amazing, brilliant BBC miniseries called Shakespeare Retold. I highly recommend The Taming of the Shrew, which I read somewhere that someone described that miniseries as being a tale of two shrews, which it's a, little, it's, it's a modern retelling. And so that modern take on Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew really appeals to me. It's more egalitarian. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's Early Henderson and Rufus Sewell. I could, I could watch it every day. It's fantastic. But so I didn't base The Infinite Onion on Shakespeare's story at all, but it is The Taming of Two Shrews. They tame each other. Mm-hmm. How many tropes would you say are at play here? Because I certainly hear what might be an enemies to lovers just off the top. <laughs> enemies to lovers, there's, yeah, I do like trope mixing. Well, actually, another one is the hurt comfort trope. Mm -hmm. Because Grant is really hurting. And, and Oliver has to make some decisions about whether he will be the one to comfort or not. Mm-hmm. One of the things I find interesting that you've done here is part of the problem is the creative kind of blow up that one of them had, but yet the other is the artist who's creative all the time. And it's just that extra level of opposites that are in play there. It took a lot of drafts to land on how that could work in a way that felt less contrived than other ways. And in the first scene of the book, actually, Grant is, it's before he's lost his job. He's just, he's on his own sort of barely out of homelessness autopilot. He doesn't have enough money to buy the breakfast that smells good at the gas station grocery store. So he buys a little Zodiac scroll mm. and it tells him if he wants to keep his job, he better get creative. He gets creative and he loses his job. His stance early in the story is that he's just angry and he doesn't know what to be angry at. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. he 
partway through, he figures out that one thing he can be angry at is himself for giving up on himself. But it's way too early for that <laughs> in the early part. Given all the elements you've got here and looking at issues like homelessness, was there a lot of research that went into this? Or did you end up and write and then fill in some of that material? Or how did that work for you? Yeah, each, every book is different. And I don't, I, you know, I have a small data pool. <laughs> it's only my second novel. And I made some interesting decisions early on in this one. So I don't have a usual, but for this novel, the research that I did happened in the mid drafts. I think I did nine drafts of this novel. And in the middle drafts, I was trying to nail down anything that a reader might be taken out of the book by, you know, anything the reader might think is a little unrealistic for the story world. Mm -hmm. Like I looked up things like, what's the legal age that a child um, has to stay in a car seat until, you know, sure, how long and that sort of thing, because I'm not a parent and I didn't know and I didn't want to put a child out of a car seat and then have an angry parent write to me and say, what are you thinking here? That's always my goal when I'm writing is to or when I'm editing is to remove all impediments to the reader leaving the story. Like my goal is a one sitting read because there's nowhere to exit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Keep the and pages so the, moving. Yep. Keep the pages moving. And so the research that I did was more on that incy level, but not on the general topics. The book I'm writing now is completely different than that. I've been reading book after book after book and just stuffing my head with all of this stuff, knowing that it will coalesce at some point. But for this book, no, I didn't do that. Mm hmm. Where did the title come from? Because I really like it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've I had you know I've been developing this book for years now, and I had at different points different people in the industry who I shared about it with tell me in no uncertain terms that that would never work. It's too weird. It's not something that the genre will support. You're gonna instantly call out the book as too literary, but I have a very strong intuitive link with stories and my writing. And, and there was just no other title that would do. So mm -hmm. I took a chance. And at this point, I'm glad I did. How does it tie to the story? You know, I could be embarrassed about this part, but I, don't, I think I'll choose not to. <laughs> I keep fairly meticulous notes about story development because I'm a journalist at heart, ultimately. I have boxes and boxes of spiral notebooks. And, and so I was able to look up exactly what the catalyst was for this title. And so if I may, I'll quote this excerpt from one of my novel notes to myself in 2017. While writing out a conversation with Grant, I remembered an old note about a story seed I referred to as the infinite onion and the gifted peeler. <laughs> I thought of it because this current novel suddenly seems to want to be about that idea. And the old note that I referred to there was from October of 28, um, about a het romance. And it said, the gifted peeler and the infinite onion is a great combo with the gifted peeler derived from Robson Green's Tony Hill character in the British TV series, Wire in the Blood. It's, it's a bit gory for my taste, but I loved watching it because of this infinite onion and gifted peeler dynamic. I was captivated by it. And then the infinite onion is a woman so multifaceted and richly layered and infinitely fascinating that he's captivated in a long-term way. Like she gives him more and more and more to peel. And she's thrilled to know someone who's not put off or scared off or daunted by or freaked out by the breadth of her personality. Having the story revolve around that type of unpeeling suddenly made a lot of Gran and Oliver's story elements click into place for me. It, it became like a unifying theme. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. How that kind of story note just connects all the dots for you all of a sudden. It did. And then the, the final note back in 2017 was the question is, which of the main characters is the onion and which is the peeler? And as I wrote the story, the answer turned out to be that both were both. That's the taming of two shrews aspect. <laughs> right. How did this story come into your head? Was there a particular something you saw that brought the story to mind or 
did it just fall into uh, to pieces over time or what was the inspiration? Yeah, it, it was a practical issue at first. Um, my first novel, Everyday History, I wanted to try something different, you know, sort of test my wings more as a novelist, maybe. And in Everyday History, the two main characters, they never don't like each other. And they're often not in the same place. I think they're together, you know, a very few number of hours throughout the whole book. That was actually the seed for The Infinite Onion, so to speak. I wanted to write a story in which the two main characters didn't like each other and were around each other often. I don't know off the top of my head why Vashon Island. I think it probably appealed to me to set it on an island because of this enforced proximity. Mm-hmm. And then Oliver's home and environs became, you know, a, a smaller enforced proximity as they become more dependent on each other through the story. But I also, you know, what a lot of factors, I mean, this is a great question because there are a lot of factors that come into it. I also write to explore issues that are up for me in my own life. And in this case, the idea of being homeless as a counterpoint to having lived in a home place for a lifetime as the two characters are. And I've lived in more than 80 places, so I will never experience a relationship with living in one home, mm-hmm. even one town. And what, you know, what would that be like? What would be the upsides and the downsides and the things I took for granted? I was, I was curious about that. And I think, let's see, at that time, at that time I had just returned from a fairly fraught situation in Germany where I'd lived for a few years. And then I'd lived in Canada for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years before that. And I was coming back to the U S for the first time, which was was where I was born. And so that was home. But, you know, after all of that moving around home was a sort of nebulous and hard to pin down feeling even. Mm Mm-hmm. I wanted to look at it more. So I created situations where I could do that. I was looking at the question, where do I belong? You know, and and what happens if home becomes a conglomerate of qualities found in different locations and cultures? You know, the best toothpaste is here and, you know, the best, (laughs) you know, I felt safest in Germany because they have these wooden blinds that go down on the windows and there are no huge natural disasters there was the nuclear power plant across the border in france that was the biggest thing and then something about the stability of the german culture just really settled me but i can't you know i don't have english there Mm -hmm. and so each country and each place has these huge things that i absolutely love and is missing things that i absolutely love somewhere else and so home was very up for me I'm not saying that I explored those exact issues in the story, but a lot of the story has to do with home and homelessness and finding home and belonging. So, You mentioned the long span of time you worked on the book and nine drafts. How much time are we talking about there to get this into ready-to-publish state? Three years. But the last two of those were while I was working a super full-time job. Mm-hmm. I would get up at six or seven and work until nine every single day. Like I think for two years in a row, I did every single day, just plugging away at it. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. I'm finally getting it out into the world. That's, that's awesome. (laughs) Thank you. You made mention of everyday history, your first novel for those who may not be familiar with that. Tell us a little bit about that book. It was a similar exploration of themes that were up for me at the time I wrote it. I wrote it while I was in Germany in 2014, I guess. And that that took a while too. I was in a long relationship that was past its expiry date. And I made the very tough decision to go for both of our sakes, you know, to save the friendship, (laughs) basically. And I was really craving acceptance for who I was, for, you know, an internal acceptance of my true deep self, and I wasn't finding it. But I thought maybe I could write it. I could write to connect with myself if I wrote a story that would help me. And so I I started this story 
that turned out to be everyday history, but I, I wrote it to, to heal. And I did. Henry, one of the two main characters, he's a museum curator who loves his work and his life. He's respected and accomplished, but lonely. And Reuben is a former high school student of Henry's who's got a crush on him, his first crush on a man. They do a dance of growing on their own while they try and imagine being together. It's, it's, I used a lot of different tools, not because I was trying to be, you know, cute or something like there are interviews and emails and stuff like that. But because I, I write super viscerally, I almost bypass my brain in a way. And that was how they needed it to be told. I'm not saying the characters are the boss, but I consider my job as I'm writing as truing. Is this the true story? Mm-hmm. And I get it wrong, and that's why I revise. And then Executive Decision is it's a longish short story, which I've published as a separate book, and I give it away as a bonus for joining my reader newsletter list. It's an alternate universe setting that gave me the freedom to zero in on and focus on the main themes of career and choices around careers and livelihood that I wanted to explore without, you know, having it to be longer story. Mm -hmm. Um, And that character is a man named Dar. He builds stone walls and he's an expert at it, but he's gotten into a tight situation with his contract And in this alternate world, that could mean some enforced action with dire results, even death potentially. But then he meets Pierre, the owner of and CEO of a trans world transportation empire. So one character struggles for empowerment in his career and the other character struggles for a life outside his career. And it's a romance with a happy ending. So they help each other figure it out. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. And we'll definitely put a link in the show notes to your email list so that people can sign up and, and get that as well. What got you started on this fiction writing path? You mentioned you're a journalist, but of course, being a journalist and being a fiction writer are two different things. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I think, I think, honestly, the fiction writing desire was always there in the background. But I had to dismantle over decades the... I guess the best way I can think of them as the should structures that kept me from believing it was okay to prioritize what I most wanted to do (laughs) rather than pushing it aside for later slash never. But all the writing I'd done before I started trying to write fiction or novels especially, I can feel myself relying on that as I write the novels. So I mean, I don't remember a time when I wasn't writing something. There's this, I'll, I'll send it out to my newsletter at some point. There's this black and white photo of me at about age three in my white nightgown and my bare feet. And I'm standing at an overturned laundry basket with a pencil poised to write over this sheet of paper. And I've looked up from my work to send the photographer, who was undoubtedly my mom or dad, a look that clearly says, well, what do you want? Can't you see I'm busy here? (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like it could have also been your very first author headshot. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And so over the decades, I've written, you know, stories and poetry and creative nonfiction, some of which was published and the first draft of a het romance, which honestly, I only finished because I had contracted with myself that if I wrote through to the end, I would buy myself all three extended play Lord of the Rings DVDs. <laughs> and I really wanted them. So I wrote through to the end. It was a powerful <laughs> self-contract you had there. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, so, yeah. And, and you've, you've got a section on your website as to why you write MM Romance. Can you tell us what was the catalyst that got you started there? Yeah, it's a mystery. It's an interesting thing. And I I find the trend and especially the, you know, the degree of the numbers about women writing MM romance, I find it utterly fascinating. I mean, do you? (laughs) 
Or what's your take on it? Yes and no in that it's romance. And romance has historically, for better or worse, been something that women read. Right. So it, to me, it makes a lot of sense that that trajectory continues. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's been a lot of discussion, too, on why it resonates so much. And I've read through some of that material. It's like, yeah, everything I see there makes sense. Everything from I like romance, so I'm just going to keep reading romance, regardless of what the pairing is, to that there's a little mm -hmm. something to it if there's not a woman in the story, because then she's not projecting herself into it because it is two men. Yeah. A lot of those resonate with me. And, you know, I, the infinite onion is about layers in part because, you know, I'm, I like to say I'm built for depth, not speed. I will keep looking further in long before I will take my head out of <laughs> the hole <laughs> start looking around <laughs> so I keep going deeper on the issue some of the things I found and resonated with I put in that article that you're referring to on my website but to answer the question when I was living in Germany I went through toward the end there when my relationship was in the process of ending and I was in the process of reclaiming my self or you know internally I went through an up level of sorts regarding my honesty about what was going on inside and who I was and what I wanted. It was not a pleasant time. <laughs> I was also running out of money and facing starting over on my own and uncertain about most things. And so I, I did something fairly radical. And Alice Archer is my pen name. We can put in the show notes a a link to an article I wrote about this, what I'm just about to tell you, that gives some more detail. It's it's in my legal name, which is fine. I'm coming out as my pen name and my legal name right here. <laughs> you got it first. Exclusive right here on the podcast. Exclusive, yeah. <laughs> it's time. And I only, as an aside, I only used a pen name or use a pen name to manage the marketing because in my legal name, I have a career as an editor. So that just keeps things separate. So I did this, for me, radical thing, which is I made a contract with myself again. I mean, it was a contract for a vacation. I couldn't afford to go anywhere, but I was up to here with overwhelm and this internal maelstrom, and I couldn't figure out a way to help myself sort it out while I was still living with the person that I was in the relationship with that was not going to happen. And so I wrote a vacation agreement, which I signed and dated and considered, I will absolutely do this, binding and official. Um, and it stated super clearly what I would and would not do during my vacation, which would run from late October through January. So I was self-employed then, as I still am. And I so I agreed to finish all my work by 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, no matter what. And I was not allowed to strategize or speculate about my future. I was allowed to stay up as late as I wanted to. I could goof around. I could read whatever I wanted to as long as I wanted to. I had all these freedoms. And I had uh, a vacation from trying to figure out my life. And so one weekend I got up ahead of steam worrying about why I felt so drawn to MM romance and questioning things. I wondered if I was not cisgendered after all. And, you know, am I the cue of questioning and what does it all mean? And finally, belatedly, I started Googling and I found, you know, on this wild ride with stops for Harry Draco fan fiction, some of which really surprised me with the thematic depth and quality of this novel link storytelling. But I found this, you know, community and that we're in now and a lot of information that helped me just calm down and feel free to write what I was being drawn to write about, wow. which was MM romance. And and I've kept, you know, in my English-German library there in Freiburg, where I lived, I found this Psychology Today article. It's from January, February 2014. It's an article by Hera Estroff Morano. It's called Love and Power. 
And in this article, she explores power plays and relationships in general. And there's a subsection on gender roles. And she says, in 200 years, says John Gottman, who's a very well-known relationship researcher, heterosexual relationships will be where gay and lesbian relationships are today. That's a long time to wait for change, but it reflects his findings that couple interactions are far more direct and kind among same-sex partners than the power struggles that arise among heterosexual ones, which is fascinating. There's a lot of cultural history and assumption just in that one idea. And so, and then Gottman did a 12-year study of same-sex couples that revealed, obviously, similarities in the ways same-sex couples operate as compared to heterosexual couples. And he says, but research has shown that there are also some qualities of strength, like humor and the ability to calm down during a fight that are especially key to same-sex couples. Things like that make me feel and conclude is that, you know, I'm doing this to bring the future forward. Like, I don't want to wait 200 years to have relationships that are like that, you know, that are more kind and more able to be calming me down during a fight. So just another facet of the whole. That's but, fascinating because you, you had some of the, that very quote you just gave us from that Psychology Today in the article I read on your website about why you write this. So that's, yeah. I like how all that, you know, ties itself back together. And, and certainly we could all use more kindness these days for we sure. Could. So it's it's great that you're writing into the future too and trying to, push it that way. Yeah, it feels good. There's there's one other element. So there's also this whole issue of writing the other. Lauren Bukes, she's an author. I really like her take on writing the other. She says, unless you're writing an autobiography, any character you write is going to be the other. <laughs> and, and so if there's a characteristic that's different in the character that's being written, then, you know, and she says, people are different. There are things we don't get about each other. Usually it's because we haven't asked. So ask and then write. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I really like that as an MO for exploration. Ask and write. You mentioned Harry and Draco fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's go back there, shall we? Um, what were some of the other stories and books that were kind of your gateways into MM romance as you started reading that? Yeah, that it, honestly, it was long before I started reading that, that there were signs and sparks. I remember, gosh, how old was I? I can't remember, but it was, you know, I was an adult out of college, but it was a long time ago. And I was living in Seattle at the time and that that movie, that Merchant Ivory movie, Morris, mm -hmm. had come out. And I went to see it, and I just remember sitting there, like, my heart was just bursting. Like, I couldn't understand what I couldn't understand. It's like, yeah, it was a great story, but, like, these people and the society, and, like, ouch, like, ouch, seriously, ouch. And I, I went back, I got sick the next day, like, with a bad cold, but the movie, it was only on for one more day. And I walked in the rain to go see it again because I just, it was back in the days when it wouldn't be out on video <laughs> for a while. So I had to go do that. So that, it's almost like that's when the questions started. And then there was Brokeback Mountain. I know you asked about books, but I'm giving you the full media answer. Sure. <laughs> then there was Brokeback Mountain, which got my attention in this regard as well. And that I can't tell you how many journals I filled with analysis and all manner of exploration and self-exploration and writing alternative happier endings and, <laughs> you know, just trying to figure out, a lot of it was just trying to figure out why I felt that was so compelling. And as a small aside, you know, I do some studies about shamanism and shamans believe that our experiences are contracted. If there are any shamans out there and I've gotten that wrong, please go to my website and send me an email and correct me. <laughs> but I'm a dabbler, not an expert. But And so it's, that helps in a way because it's almost like I contracted to come here and write 
male male romance novels and I'm still trying to understand the why and then I I have over the years read Ian Forster's Morris and and other books uh, fiction and memoirs by gay men and then also Suzanne Brockman's novel Hot Target Mm -hmm. um, which she prefaced with her plea for inclusion and dedicated to her gay son the short answer now that I've told you the long answer is that that's what came out so to speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when I finally sat down to write a novel after the Lord of the Rings reward, <laughs> <laughs> the novel I wrote became Everyday History, and that's my path, apparently. We we don't often hear ones that quite take that trajectory either, so it, it's good to get that kind of perspective, too. How can people keep up with you online to keep up with everything else going on? On my website, alicearcher.com, it has all the details including a subscription to the newsletter and executive decision for free and social media links. But I feel like this is a good time to say that I'm so new at all the public facing stuff. I'm still learning how to do social media and other basic things. So bear with me as I get through the learning curves and it's happening. And I'm interested, very interested in connecting with readers. So please feel free to contact me however is comfortable for you. Awesome. We'll put links to your site and your social media into the show notes as well so that people can can keep up both with how the Infinite Onion rolls out and, of course, as the new stuff comes along as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Alice. It's been awesome talking to you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. I love what you guys are doing. 